Right, welcome everyone to the Vanya 90 School, um, the virtual edition. Of course, this isn't the way we had intended to hold this workshop. Um, uh, it was supposed to be in, in Oxford face to face, but uh, the coronavirus developments um, changed those plans. And I'm actually very, very grateful to Giovanni and the people he has worked with in order to get the technology for being able to do this uh, remotely in place. Um, hopefully this will go very, very well. And uh, again, very grateful to, to Giovanni and his co-workers for, for making sure this can happen. And also all the speakers and, uh, and tutors for uh, preparing everything, uh, in particular the tutorials to be done in this remote environment. And thank you to you all for, for being here. I know many of you are in, um, different time zones and uh, are up either very late in the evening or very early in the morning to, to join us here. But I think one of the benefits of this is that uh, more people can participate and I hope we'll have some very interesting discussions and interactions uh, online. Um, so, uh, Vanya 90, um, this uh, is an introductory talk. Uh, to tell you about a few of the things that have been going on uh, in, in recent years and months, and um, to give you a little preview of some of the things that uh, you will see uh, later on in this, in this workshop. So my name is Arash Mustafi, I'm from Imperial College London, and uh, together with uh, Jonathan Yates, Giovanni Pizzi, Nicola Marzari, David Vanderbilt, uh, and Ivo Souza, and Valerio Vitale, uh, I'm one of the developers of the Vanya 90 code. So you all know, hopefully, what Vanya functions are. They provide a localized and real space picture of electronic structure in real space and have increasingly become um, important, more and more important in the analysis uh, of uh, materials and molecular systems. Um, in terms of analyzing their electronic structure, interpreting chemical bonding, uh, their deep connection to, to polarization and orbital magnetization. Um, they can be used efficient, uh, minimal basis set for uh, constructing type binding models, for calculating electronic transport, and uh, in, in recent years, uh, in very phase properties as well. So we'll see elements of all of these aspects of their applications throughout uh, this, uh, this school. Just to give a quick recap, um, many functions uh, come from uh, initially doing a electronic ground state calculation using your favorite electronic structure code, whatever that uh, may be, um, and uh, taking the uh, block wave functions that uh, are the eigenstates of the uh, uh, usually the cone sham Hamiltonian, um, and uh, performing a unitary transformation on those block wave functions uh, to generate uh, localized functions in real space. And you can think of this uh, as essentially a rotation of of, of the basis to a localized representation. And here's the expression for, for that in general. So uh, we have a, a unitary matrix here that mixes block states um, at a given K um, in order to construct a smooth gauge. And then once you have that smooth gauge given by this sum over the uh, block states, you do a Fourier transform to uh, generate your localized functions uh, given by this ket rn. So your Vanier functions are uh, localized within, um, within certain uh, unit cells labeled by the lattice vector r, and they retain this band-like index n. Um, this unitary matrix uh, is non-unique, um, so there are uh, many ways to construct um, uh, a set of smooth uh, uh, block-like states from the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And uh, with maximally localized venue functions, the way you, you, uh, you choose which gauge uh, you want is by, uh, by 
minimizing the total quadratic spread of the set of Vanier functions that uh, you're interested in. So this is an expression for the quadratic spread. And by minimizing this, you sort of fix that non-uniqueness um, uh, and choose a particular, particular gauge. And this is uh, described in the original paper by Nicola Marzari and David Vanderbilt from 1997. The ingredients that you need in order to perform these, uh, this operation, um, uh, the main ingredient is uh, this matrix M of overlaps between uh, the periodic parts of the block wave functions at uh, neighboring K points. So U is uh, the periodic part of a, of a block function with band index M and, uh, and crystal momentum K. And so the, the electronic structure code, once it's calculated the block functions, then calculates these matrix elements, which it passes on to, to Vanier 90. And the uh, expression for the spread, which is what you're minimizing, uh, can be written in terms of uh, these matrix elements. Uh, optionally, um, you can specify uh, an initial guess for the unitary matrix U. Um, and uh, usually that's constructed uh, using uh, sets of predefined atom or bond-centered uh, atomic or hybrid orbitals, uh, s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, etc. Um, and uh, you can generate this this matrix of projections where you project the Bloch wave functions onto your guesses for the Vanier functions. And then, if you orthogonalize uh, this matrix um, using a Loudin transformation, that gives you a an initial guess for your for your um, uh, unitary transformation. Um, which is then further optimized by the Vanier 90 code. Um, more recently, uh, a method due to um, the group of uh, Lin Lin in, in Berkeley, and we'll hear more about this from Anil Damley tomorrow, who's giving a talk about it and, uh, and a tutorial following it, is this uh, selected columns of the density matrix method, uh, which uh, enables you to generate Vanier functions without um, specifying and uh, initial guess for the for the uh, for the Vanier functions themselves, and uh, this this is particularly interesting because um, especially when when it comes to uh, disentangling uh, bands from band you know from other bands that are attached to them uh, at higher and lower energies. So often you're interested in in generating Vanier functions for a subset of bands in your band structure, and they may or may not be attached to bands above and below them. In the case that they are attached to, to bands above and below them, often uh, one of the most time consuming elements of, of the calculation is figuring out what is a good initial, initial guess to, um, to enable the, the optimization of the Vanier functions to proceed uh, smoothly and, uh, and quickly. Um, this, uh, this SCDM method, which we'll hear about tomorrow, in particular, alleviates some of the problems associated with choosing initial guesses for um, for uh, bands that are entangled with with other bands so it's, it's I think it's a very exciting method and um, its implementation and application to a uh, to a high throughput study is published and is has been accepted um, in uh, NPJ computational materials and can be read on archive at this uh, at this link here. Uh, so that should be appearing soon. Um, from the from the beginning, uh, when Jonathan and I um, started thinking about uh, writing Vanier ninety, uh, we had a number of things in our mind regarding the design philosophy. So uh, we wanted it to be modular. We wanted it to be written in, in modern Fortran. Uh, we wanted it to be well documented and commented. Um, uh, we had decided quite early on that it would be an open source code. We both had experience of um, commercial uh, software development 
projects in materials modeling and and we had decided that we wanted it to be open source for this one and uh to have a version control repository and a suite of and a suite of tests and in those days they weren't integrated and automatic tests but we nonetheless had a had a suite of uh, a small suite of tests and the reason we wanted to to, to do these things was um first of all uh to make it very easy for us to add new functionality but also to make it easy for other people to, to add new functionality if if other developers came on board um, and uh, another thing that was in our minds was that we were quite keen for the code to be as easy to interface to um, any electronic structure code uh, as possible so uh, you know we didn't want it to be particularly tied to one electronic structure code that we happen to be to be expert in or whatever so uh, for that reason um, we made vanier 90 as uh, as a code electronic structure code independent as possible and we did that by not requiring it to have any information about the underlying basis set that the electronic structure code was using or the fft grid or uh, any of those sorts of uh, implementational details of the underlying electronic structure code we only required it to have the matrix elements that I mentioned earlier, the M matrix and the A matrix is matrix of overlaps of the periodic parts of the block functions and the, um, the uh, uh, projections of the localized orbitals um, onto the block functions together with the eigenvalues uh, that come out of the, that come out of the, um, the electronic structure code. Um, so those were really the only elements that needed to be passed to Vanier 90 in order for it to, to, to do its work, um, which means that any code can, uh, can write a relatively simple interface uh, to Vanier 90. The benefit of that, of course, is that as developments are made in Vanier 90, they're very easily accessible to everyone in the community who uses any type of electronic structure code. So that was really the main, the main um, uh, driving force behind that decision and uh, these days uh, Vanier 90 interfaces to uh, quite a large number of uh, electronic structure codes which probably um, uh, covers uh, uh, quite a large fraction of the user base in materials science uh, the computational materials modeling uh, so the, the electronic structure codes here are, are on the bottom of the slide so big dft quantum espresso fleur gpor abinet elk siesta pi scf 2k vasp octopus openmx so they all have interfaces to vanier 90 so you can run vanier 90 off the back of an electronic structure calculation with one of these codes and then there's a whole family of, of codes that then use the results of Vanier 90 to do further post-processing um, of, of those uh, Vanier functions, including things to do with topological insulators, things to do with transport, DMFT, uh, optics, um, high throughput calculations, and electron phonon interactions. And so some of these things we will, we will see uh, uh, during the course of uh, of this school, so including electron phonon and high throughput and topological properties. So we'll, we'll see some of these things in the next couple of days. Uh, one quite large change that's uh, occurred in the past uh, few years, certainly since the last time we had a school like this, um, is the way in which Vanier 90 is, uh, is developed. Um, so in the past, uh, we had uh, a, a small group of developers, um, three, four, five people, who uh, who were the active contributors uh, to the code, and we had our own uh, uh, version control repository um, that, uh, that that we used to to make the developments and periodically released code, typically once every couple of years, a new version of the code. Uh, about three or four years ago, four years ago, we moved to a very different model because it became very clear that um, it, was, it was almost impossible for a small group of people like this to, to do all of the sorts of exciting developments that could be done 
uh, with Vanier functions, and that there was a growing community of of uh, of people who uh, were doing very interesting things, and uh, that would be really good to incorporate into the main into the main code. So we moved to a model where now we have a global community of Vanier 90 contributors um, who through uh, GitHub, which is where now the, the, the repository of Vanier 90 resides, through GitHub can, um, can make pull requests to contribute to, to Vanier 90. And uh, those pull requests are sort of uh, um, uh, reviewed by uh, the Vanier developers group, the original group of people who sort of developed the code um, and are incorporated into Vanier 90 um, uh, during the uh, during the release cycle. So uh, this is a very, very big, big change uh, for us. And it has been really wonderful, actually, to see uh, how uh, people across the world are now contributing to, to Vanier 90. And actually, this this workshop is a fantastic example of that, because many of the contributors are uh, speaking uh, at this school uh, in the next couple of days and leading tutorials on the developments that they they have done so um, that's really wonderful to see um, as a result of uh, uh of of this work by by this global community uh the code has now got many new features and and uh, and many new applications and these are summarized in this new paper um, that uh, was out recently in the Journal of Physics Condensed Matter, which has 31 contributors and developers as, as co-authors, which again just demonstrates this, um, this global effort now to, to push forward uh, the, uh, the, the development of the Vanier code. Uh, so again, really, really wonderful to see this happening. So we're now at uh, Vanier release version uh, 3.1, which was uh, released uh, just uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, so this was a uh, a little update on on the main Vanier 3.0 release from from last year. Um, just a few statistics on the distribution. So the distribution is 173 megabytes in size, uh, which is uh, relatively large. But actually, if you break that down, you see that most of it is um, is the test suite uh, and the examples. Uh, we have a quite an extensive a library of, of, of tutorial examples in there now and the documentation. And the source code is, is actually only 1.6 megabytes uh, uncompressed, uh, which is around 40,000 lines of code, including, including the comments. So it's still a relatively, uh, relatively manageable and small uh, source, but growing every day. Um, Vanier 90 has um, two, uh, two parts. So there's the uh, main Vanier 90.x executable, um, which can run in serial or uh, as of uh, relatively recently in, in parallel as well. And this executable has the uh, sort of spread minimization that generates the, uh, the Vanier functions and the unitary transformations themselves. Um, it enables you to visualize the Vanier functions, plot them. Uh, it has some band interpolation capability, some Fermi surface plotting, outputs the real space Hamiltonian, and has some quantum transport capability in it as well. And then all the other um, all the other uh, properties are calculated using uh, post Vanier 90, post W90.x, which is another code that's part of the distribution. Um, and that is uh, that can run in serial or parallel uh, as well. And this um, this separation is is uh, slightly uh, historical and uh, is one of the things that we will we will review um, in the in the coming years. Um, so uh, the the history behind this is that the Vanier 90 executable used to just be a serial code um, and had uh, you know this basic functionality in it. And then some of the additional properties uh, were very suitable, which are very suitable to parallelization, um, were coded up in a separate, uh, separate post Vanier 90.x part of the code, which, which was then the parallel part. So the idea was you did the Vanierization in serial, and then you did the 
post vanierization so all the property calculations in in parallel um, so that distinction is now um, perhaps less relevant and is one of the things I think we will we will review uh, as as time goes on and the only requirements you need to to run the code are a uh, Fortran compiler uh, some linear algebra libraries some MPI libraries and uh, going to make to, to do the build. As I mentioned earlier, the version control is on GitHub. Uh, hopefully you've all seen the GitHub pages and anyone can um, contribute to, uh, to the code uh, by forking uh, from, the, from the main developer branch, um, doing their developments and, and doing a pull request which is then tested and, and reviewed. Um, there's a suite of tests um, using a modified version of James Spencer's uh, test code program um, and uh, nightly uh, builds and nightly tests on a build bot test farm to make sure that uh, to make sure that everything is is running smoothly and no bugs have been introduced. Um, every time a, a pull request is made, um, the, uh, the twist test suite is automatically run. So this is uh, uh, continuous integration. Um, and uh, if, if any tests fail, then uh, the pull request is blocked and uh, the failure is reported back. So uh, th those things need to be fixed before, before any pull requests can be, can be merged. Um, we do have a... Um, a style guide so uh, we're, we're quite keen to try to keep the keep the code fairly clean easy to read and consistent in style so there is a documented style guide uh, on the github repository so anyone who's interested in um, contributing to the code should certainly have a read of that first and try to make sure their code conforms to that style guide um, so that we can keep the code looking reasonably consistent and easy to easy to read. Um, and there are some improved command line interface options as well uh, in, in version three, including a, a dry run mode, which enables you to um, uh, get the code to essentially pass through your input file to make sure that everything is, is okay uh, without actually running a full, full calculation. So here are some of the uh, uh, key features in uh, version three. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but I'm just going to highlight the things that um, we're going to cover uh, in this uh, in this school. So uh, there'll be um, talks on and tutorials on symmetry adapted banner functions. Uh, so that's going to be led by Yusuke Nomura, who I think is here with us. Um, SCDM method. Uh, which is being led by Anil Damley, Berry Phase Properties, which is being led by Huang Cheng Wu and Ivo Souza, uh, AIDA Plugin, which is going to be led by Giovanni Pizzi and Antimo Marazzo, and um, the uh, Electron Phonon NEA EPW interface, which is going to be led by Samuel Ponce and Roxana Marcin. I hope I haven't uh, omitted to mention anyone, anyone there. So. Um, sorry, maybe Valerio Vitale as well, I should mention, with the SCDM method, together with Anil Demley. Um, so that's what we're going to hear about. Um, as I mentioned earlier, very, very grateful to, to Giovanni and the people he's been working with to get all of this working online, in particular, organizing uh, all of these Zoom meetings um, and the Quantum Mobile Virtual Machine, uh, which is going to be the engine we will use to uh, do the tutorials. So thank you very much for that. Uh, here is the schedule. So we are currently uh, up here. This is the introduction talk. Uh, the, I see there's going to be plenty of time for questions because I'm almost finished. And uh, we're going to move on to berry phases after this and then the tutorial on berry phases in the afternoon. Um, with symmetry adapted venue functions, automated venue functions with SCDM and AIDA tomorrow, and then finally uh, electron phonon coupling and the EPW code on Friday.
One thing uh, I wanted to mention, because this is something uh, we would very much like uh, to hear your feedback on, um, uh, is a future direction that we want to we want to pursue, uh, and we're just about to start to work on this uh, very actively. Um, so, at the moment, the main mode in which Vanier ninety is is used is as a separate uh, standalone. Uh, executable, whether it's the Vanier 90.x executable or the post W90.x executable, um, which communicates with uh, an external program, whether that is um, an electronic structure code or, you know, essentially an electronic structure code. It, it communicates with that code via files that are written and read um, to and from disk. Okay, so this is really the main mode in which Vanier 90 is used. Um, there is also a library mode, and there has been from, from version one, um, where Vanier 90 can be called from within an electronic structure code um, as, a, as a library call. And schematically, it sort of works like this, where you know, inside your code, you calculate the electronic structure, you have your modules and subroutines that calculate the, the bands, and then you can call a Vanier setup routine, which sets up uh the calculation you know essentially calculates the the things that would normally go into the into the file that um the external program would read um and then uh but that's all done now internally through this library call and then the electronic structure code could calculate uh the things that vanier 90 needs and then you have another call which runs vanier 90 again as a library call and then um that is returned to the program, which can then calculate things from the results. So, you know, th this one could en envisage as being something you could do within an SCF loop if you were sort of interested in uh, calculating, let's say, um, uh, Vanier functions on the fly uh, during a during a molecular dynamics run, for example. Uh, this is something that you could you could do. Um, the functionality and Vanier 90's library mode is fairly basic, so it, it doesn't include a lot of the new functionality that we have added in in recent in recent years, and it's also um, uh, only it also only works in serial. Um, so one of the one of the things that we want to do is to is, is to essentially um, uh, rewrite or re-engineer the library mode of Vanier 90 to be much more complete. Um, and we have a major effort at starting now uh, with two years of manpower from uh, the funding council in the UK um, to, to do this. Um, and one of the first steps in this is to collect uh, what I call user stories. So uh, ways in which this sort of library functionality uh, might be used by um, the community of Vanier 90 users, uh, both now and also sort of further in the future, the ways that it could be used in the future. Um, the, the, the reason for doing this is so that, you know, from the start when we're designing this new, new library functionality, to really have a clear idea of the ways in which it is likely to be used, because that itself will inform the way that we, that we design it. So, it would be really great if all of you here um, could have a think about the ways in which you might use um, such a library. Uh, imagine, you know, imagine Vanier 90 uh, having a library that did everything that the code, that the main code, the main executable currently currently can do. So have a think about that. Have a think how you might use that uh, within within an external program. Um, and we would be very, very interested to hear. I think uh, probably at some point we'll try and make a Google document or a or a or a form where people can fill in their ideas so that we have we have everything in one place. For now, you can just sort of you know maybe email us or or, or tell us what you what you think uh, and what ideas you have. But that would be really interesting. So that would be the first step. And then the second step is that the parallel behave parallelism behavior required by such a code um, is going to be uh, a little bit more challenging to deal with because you know uh, when you embed a library inside another code, 
then you know if those if the external code and the library have different different um, uh, different uh, parallel behavior or, or or different parallel strategies that are optimal, then uh, managing conflicts between those different optimal parallel strategies becomes becomes something quite important to do. Um, and finally, uh, you know, you don't want a library call to that goes wrong. Maybe there's an uh, an error in the in in the library call. So you call the library. There's an error in the calculation. You don't necessarily want that error to derail a much larger calculation that it is part of. So uh, handling errors unobtrusively and, and safely is also sort of a, a, an interesting challenge in, in making this work really well. Um, in the very long term, so once this is sort of all tested and is, is working, what we would quite like to do is for Vanier 90, the main code itself, to be restructured as a wrapper for its own library. So a bit like the Ouroboros that uh, swallows its own tail. So for Vanier 90 executable to really just be a wrapper that calls its own library, that would be uh, really the, uh, the ultimate aim of, of, of these developments. So um, I think I shall stop there. Uh, I think we have plenty of time uh, for questions. So um, I will stop sharing my screen uh, like this. And hopefully you can see me back and uh, maybe we can open it to questions. <laughs>